Sexual vitality, great subject. Um, I want to honor my friend Alex Gray's work here. Um, you might have seen his work. He so beautifully depicts the chakras and the auras and all the energy fields of the body. Um, him and his wife Allison are wonderful artists. So sexual energy is extra energy. And there's this huge quest about, you know, how can I enhance my libido and have greater sex and be even more amazing and please my partner. And we need to keep in mind that if we are sick, if we're depleted, exhausted, that one of the first things to go is our sexual vitality. It's as if the body knows that procreation would not be a really good idea at this time. If you don't have energy, what are you gonna do if a baby comes into your life? You know, that takes so much energy. So we need to remember that sexual energy really is designed to get us to procreate. So if we have a partner and they're not feeling well, they're coming down with a, a cold or they're uh, getting over the flu, for example, it may be that we want to find other ways to show our love and devotion, that really cuddling and spooning and really just sharing affection uh, could be so much more healing than getting all riled up and uh, elevated and having orgasms. So we just need to know that, that really sexual energy is something that permeates our life in every way. And it doesn't just happen in the bedroom. You know, if you want to have more and better sex with your partner, foreplay can start all day long. It can be all the kind things that you do for one another. It can be helping one another with their chores and speaking kindly to one another. So very often, the problem isn't just that our libido is low, it's that we've armored ourselves with unkind things that we've said or not being sensitive to our partner's needs. So I often like to remind people, too, that with sexual energy, uh, especially with women, you know, women's genitalia are more enclosed. They're more private, more secret. It's like a flower. And you have to get the flower to want to open. And so I caution people against jumping for the genitals because if you have two stressed out people and their head hurts and they've been staring at a computer all day and their shoulders are achy, how are you going to have wonderful sex with your beloved if your body is all stiff? So foreplay can be things like sharing a, a massage. Maybe you don't have time to do a whole massage, but you know, trading foot massages while you lay on the couch, for example, or hand massages are so wonderful. It might just be one part of the body that you really just relax, and if the relaxation goes in here, you'll find that the rest of the body opens up and relaxes. Soaking in the bathtub together can be another wonderful way of foreplay. So if you're going to bed with your partner and thinking like, oh, don't touch me there, I'm not clean, you know, you're already inhibited. So you really want to think about having everything in your body in working order. And so another way that we deplete our sexual energy is by eating foods that cause us to feel foggy and soggy and groggy. I always thought it was a bad sign um, when I would see my partner eating uh, ice cream before bed. I think ice cream has got to be one of the worst foods for libido. It's, it's dairy, it's sugary, it's fatty, it's cold. And you're going to find as we explore nutrition for sexuality that you want foods that are going to uh, be full of life and be energizing and not, uh, s you don't want to satisfy your hunger before bed, you want to save some of that hunger and passion for your beloved. So going to bed with a, a little bit of an appetite is really a better guarantee for having great lovemaking. So I love the symbol of the yin-yang, but a lot of people don't realize that it represents the union of yin and yang, of masculine, feminine, uh, cold and hot, light and dark. And it could, it, it doesn't necessarily mean um, everything is an opposite, but if you look at the yin yang symbol, it symbolizes that there are elements of the opposite within each element. We might say, well, men have a lot of testosterone. Well, women have some testosterone too. 
or women have a lot of estrogen, but men also have some estrogen. And testosterone is not only a hormone of libido, it's also a hormone of drive and ambition. So when men go to a urologist, for example, and they're looking for something to enhance their libido, they're often given a drug like Viagra, but women get testosterone. And it's very likely that some men might have more estrogen than their partner. Their, their female partner might have more testosterone than they do. So just know that we're moving into a time where we really can play with the roles and not have to be limited and, you know, have to dress a certain way or, um, you know, grow up playing with certain toys. It's really a beautiful thing. The yin-yang is constantly moving and very multidimensional. So, uh, as I said earlier, good nutrition is certainly a great way to feel good in your body. And if your body feels great, then you're more apt to want to share it with your beloved. So, in Asian medicine, it's said that the kidneys govern libido. And I know we might think that that's a little strange because you don't ever hear that in Western medicine. Like, aren't the kidneys like back here? Yes, absolutely. Our kidneys are associated with the water element of the body. And they govern all things to do with mineral balance in the body. So the health of our teeth, our bones, the hair on our head, our sense of hearing, as well as sex drive, all are generated from the kidneys. It's also said, healthy kidneys, long life. So one of the best ways we can nourish our kidneys is by eating more black foods. And I've really been finding it quite wonderful and challenging to uh, name what are some of the black foods that we can eat. So really, the colors of foods tell us a lot. So when you see a food that's black, providing that it's not like artificially dyed black licorice or something, but it means that there's lots of minerals in there. And so the flavor associated with this water element or the kidneys is the salty flavor. So a really simple thing we can do to nourish our kidneys is to think about using better quality salt. We've really been bamboozled in the salt world because most salt, including sea salt, is heated to about 1,400 degrees, and then the minerals are removed from the salt and sold to the vitamin companies. So you want to start looking for salt that's darker in color. Think Himalayan salt or Celtic salt. Your salt should be more pink or gray or brown or, or red colored. So, you know, that's a, a great way to nourish that element. One of my favorite black foods is chia seeds. And if you think about chia seeds, they were one of the favorite foods of Native American runners. They are great for endurance. Runners that had to run long distances and go from one tribe to the other would often subsist all day long on a, a little uh, skin filled with flax se uh, chia seeds and water. So chia seeds are not only a black food, but they are full of reproductive energy. If you were to go outside and plant a bowl of oatmeal, it would just rot in the ground, right? But if you were to plant chia seeds, it could grow into fantastic little green sprouts. Did you ever grow a, a chia pet? So one thing about chia seeds, you don't want to eat them dry. They absorb seven times their weight in water. So if you're eating them dry, it can actually dry you up and make you more constipated. So if you soak your chia seeds overnight, I like to soak them overnight so they start sprouting. They really start coming to life. And they also have this moistening, lubricating quality to them. So when we think about sexuality, we think about our sexual fluids. So chia seeds moisten the yin. They, they nourish the moisture of our body. And they're great for lubricating our joints, and they're high in omega-3, so they're great for our brain energy as well. I uh, travel with chia seeds a lot. One pound of chia seeds can make a month's worth of breakfast, but you flavor them up. I mean, they don't taste really like anything, 
but neither does oatmeal. But you can add blueberries and walnuts and um, goji berries and all kinds of wonderful superfoods to them. Um, I, you know, I don't eat a lot of grains, but if I do eat grains, I'm going to go for black rice or wild rice because, you know, brown rice pales in comparison. So again, more minerals. Um, same thing with beans. Beans are not a big part of my diet, but if I'm in a situation where I'm eating beans, I'm going to go for black beans. I don't find that they're that digestible sprouted. So, but I do always soak beans overnight and then rinse them. And another great ally we have in the realm of dark colored blackish foods are the seaweeds. So think about the seaweeds. They grow in this mineral rich brine of the ocean. They transform the nutrients, the minerals of the ocean so that our bodies can utilize them. And um, another thing we should think about I know there's been some talk this morning about thyroid health. Well, the health of the kidneys in the water element also nourishes our thyroid. So if you have low metabolism, you're cold all the time, adding some sea vegetables to your diet might also be a great idea. I like to get sea vegetables from uh, places like Maine. Uh, it's all one ocean. You know, we really need to be careful about how polluted our ocean is becoming. And it's all connected, even if you're harvesting seaweed. And that's one reason why we come together to talk not only about our own health, but the health of the planet. Uh, black sesame seeds are a wonderful longevity tonic. And anything that you've done with white or brown sesame seeds, you can do with black sesame seeds. You can even find black tahini. I try to get my clients away from eating peanut butter. You know, peanut butter is uh, very often crop rotated with cotton. And since cotton is not considered a food crop, there's no restrictions on the amount of pesticides that can be used on the cotton. And then the next season, peanuts are very often planted there. Peanuts also contain um, um, yeah, aflatoxin, a carcinogenic type of mold. So, um, you know, think more black sesame, tahini, almond butter, those would be healthier choices. But we also have black foods like blackberries and elderberries. So, uh, I, it's just really easy to think about eating the rainbow and eating a wide variety of colors. So, nuts and seeds are also the reproductive part of the plant. And so if you wanted to create new life, which is what sexuality is really luring us to do, you would use the, the seeds of the plant to create new life. And I think my daughter Rainbow would be embarrassed if I told you this story, but I've, I've told it many times, but I'm going to just share this with you. When she was in sixth grade, she came home one day and she says, Mom, you need to help me. They took pictures of the kids at school today and they lined us up according to our height. Did they ever do that when you were in grade school? She says, Mom, I was one of the, the smaller ones. You, you got to help me. And I said, you want to get taller? She said, yes. I said, raw sunflower seeds. <laughs> sunflower seeds are full of zinc and zinc is great for growth and maturation. And then in about eighth grade, she said, Mom, you need to help me. I need breasts. I said, oh, breasts you want, huh? Pumpkin seeds. So anyways, you can Google her, Rainbow Mars. Um, she, she makes it onto a lot of magazine covers. But all nuts and seeds do contain that life force if they're raw. If you were to plant a raw sunflower seed, it has the life potential to grow into a 10, maybe 20 foot tall plant. But if you plant a roasted salted tamari sunflower seed, I know they taste good, but they don't it, it doesn't matter if you pray over it or put crystals or pyramids. Nothing is going to happen. Um, and, you know, you can soak your sunflower seeds overnight, rinse them, and put some uh, nama shoyu tamari on them and dehydrate them, and then they do taste like tamari sunflower seeds. Uh, pumpkin seeds are also one of the best foods for protecting the male prostate gland. So, you know, 
Go Broncos. I heard a lot of commotion in the airport last night. Um, you know, so soak your seeds overnight and, and enjoy that while you're watching um, games and things like that. Cashews, unfortunately, are usually heated. Uh, they have a fruit on them, so cashews usually are not really raw. And they are a member of the poison ivy family. Cashews and pistachios. So when I work with people with skin conditions, I usually try to back off of those two nuts just because they... Uh, can aggravate some skin conditions, but hazelnuts have become one of my favorites. I love to make hazelnut milk. So include more nuts and also seeds in your life. So flax seeds are another great seed. They are also high in omega-3s and omega-6s. They're very lubricating, but again, you, it's best if you don't eat them dry. So soak them overnight, or if you do make flax crackers, be sure to drink a lot of water so you don't dehydrate yourself. Hemp seeds would be another wonderful seed to make use of. And hemp seeds are actually the second highest source of vegetable protein. Soybeans comes in first, but soybeans can be very difficult to digest for a lot of people. I find soy is much more digestible if it's fermented. I don't do lots of tofu or soy milk. I would be more likely to do things like um, tempeh, but um, hemp seeds makes wonderful milk, wonderful butter. It has a flavor much like sunflower seeds and sort of pine nuts, and they are not psychoactive at all, so you don't have to worry about getting tested at work or anything like that. Okay, well, Bob Marley would be proud. Roots rock reggae. Eating more roots. Roots grow deep into the earth, and they energize your lower chakras. They are rich in minerals, and they're also very grounding. One of the things that sometimes impairs our libido is we're just in our head too much. We're thinking all the time. So if you want to feel more embodied, Eat more roots. They help connect you to the earth. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah, one of my daughters says, Mom, my, my yoga teacher said I need to get more grounded. How do I get more grounded? Eat more roots. Just makes sense. So I, I don't want to really promote white potatoes or anything like that. So I'm thinking um, sweet potatoes, which are in a totally different family. Sweet potatoes are in the morning glory family. Uh, rutabaga, turnip burdock root those are some roots beets would be another one uh, roots that you might try we'll be we'll talk about maca in a little bit ginger is another root that's good for libido now there's this myth out there that i think a lot of americans think that they need to eat red meat for libido and it's really promoted in the restaurant trade and um, the media that you know foods that are red are good for blood and passion and zest and all that but to be honest one of the downfalls of high meat consumption is that it can clog your arteries and if your arteries are impaired and circulation can't get to the peripheral parts of your body example, the genitals, then you may find that you are non-orgasmic or that you lack um, strong erections. So eating meat can really have its downfall. Um, and so I would say look for other red colored foods. Pomegranates are full of seeds. We also know that pomegranates are a traditional food for fertility and they're red, they're beautiful, they're so sensual to eat, they have anti-parasitic properties. They look kind of like they have a yin-yang symbol in them. They're in the same family as henna. Not surprised, right? And remember Shirley Temple cocktails when you were little? It was pomegranate juice that made them red. So another sensual fruit. You're going to see that a lot of the fruits that I recommend for sexuality are either red or orange in color. You've all heard of the chakras? Like the rainbow going through our body and like red is at the very base of our spine and corresponds more to male sexuality and orange corresponds more to female sexuality. But red, uh, orange also corresponds to the prostate gland. So orange 
Um, we could say that red foods often contain lycopene, which helps to protect the male prostate gland, but foods that are orange in color often have carotenoids in them. So found in carrots and peaches and things like that. So persimmons are delicious and they have a wonderful fleshy quality to them. You have to get them when they're ripe and we only have them for a short time, usually around the winter holiday season. And I also think that when you eat a piece of fruit, if you share it with your beloved, you're putting your love intention into it. So rather than saying, here, you have that apple and I'll have this apple. But how much more powerful when you go slice, 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 or you're sharing from the same apple. It's like you're eating from the same piece of fruit and you can really be putting your love intentions in there for creating oneness and harmony. So a little bit of food magic there. My friend Michael says, where the women go, the men go. You're really lucky. You probably have mangoes growing here in Orlando. Yes? Ah, they're so wonderful. Queen of fruits. And mangoes are um, said to have anti-cancer properties, very high in carotenoids, very sensual to eat. But they are also in the poison ivy family. Yeah, so don't get the skin on your chin or you might uh, get a rash. And I know some of you adventurous types might have dabbled in the pleasures of eating fruit off your beloved. You know, little nibble here, nibble there. Don't try that with mangoes. I speak from experience. It can give you a really bad rash in a very sensitive place. So we want to avoid that. But more, a lot of, all of these fruits right here in this picture are in the rose family. The rose family, rosaceae. It, 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 you notice if you've ever cut an apple in half uh, lengthwise, you get a beautiful star shape in there. All of these fruits are related. Apples, peaches, plums, nectarines. And not only are they sweet and juicy, many of them are red colored. So think about bringing more color into your life. I think Americans have gotten into the beigeness of food consumption. And so how beautiful is a bowl that has multicolored fruits and different hues in there. Raspberries have wonderful anti-cancer properties. In herbal medicine, and I'm sure in lots of other natural medicine fields around the world, there's this beautiful symbol. Um, it's a philosophy called the doctrine of signatures. How many of you have heard of the doctrine of signatures? So the doctrine of signatures is something that ancient peoples relied on. And they said, the plants tell you what they're good for by the way they look and by the way they grow. And you know, ancient peoples didn't have Google or Wikipedia or my phone app, iPlant. They really would look at the plants and say, hmm, yeah, raspberries, they look kind of like a tumor. Maybe they're good for tumors. Or they might say, um, you know, cherries are really uh, red in color. They're probably good for building your blood. When my daughters were living at home and getting their menstrual time, their moon time, we called it, I would always make them borscht. Is it a myth? Do you think borscht, it's a myth that it builds your blood? No, beets are high in iron. They really are blood building, as are many of these wonderful fruits. Well, I'm glad that it's fig season. And fig seasons, uh, well, figs, are in the same family as mulberries. And they're pollinated by wasps. And look, they are full of seeds and they are so juicy and succulent, you want to eat them while they're available because it's really a short season. But we can have dried figs the rest of the year. Dried fruits can be very, very concentrated, though, so I prefer to soak them in water overnight so you're not getting such a heavy uh, sugar concentrate in the morning. Well, a couple of vegetables here. Actually, technically, avocado is a fruit because it contains its seed inside. And avocados contain lecithin. And lecithin is one of the components of our sexual fluids. So avocados are high in good fats. I, I saw this thing on Facebook. It was an avocado looking in the mirror saying to himself, you're fat. 
but you're good fat. So that's how I feel about avocados. I'm not going to worry about the amount of calories in an avocado when I see a food that is so satisfying, so delicious. And for those of you who are, you know, eating a high raw or, or all raw, you might find that a salad doesn't really satisfy you, but you add an avocado to it and it becomes rich and really satisfying. They actually, in the ancient uh, Aztec culture, they called avocado awaktal, meaning testicle tree. You see, very well hung tree there. And uh, artichokes, you know, artichokes are the descendant of thistles. So I know thistles are one of the noxious weeds of just about every county in America. People always want to like, we've got to kill those thistles. But if it weren't for thistles, we wouldn't have artichokes. And when you eat an artichoke, you are actually eating an unopened flower bud. And what a sensual experience to share an artichoke with your beloved. Artichokes are the one vegetable that there's more of after you eat it than before. Think about that. After you eat it, you've got like this big plate of <laughs> artichokes that don't really fit anywhere. So nature also gives us flowers. And flowers are the sex organs of plants. So flowers actually attract pollinators. Now, not all flowers are edible. There's some that are very toxic. Lily of the valley, for example, very toxic. Death camas. Don't eat, don't eat flowers with the name death in it. Uh, <laughs> loco weed, poison hemlock. Stay away from those. But we have marigolds and nasturtiums. And uh, of course, we want to eat only organic flowers. Don't eat flowers from the florist. Uh, they could be grown in another uh, country. They could be sprayed with chemicals that are banned in our country. But if you think about flowers, they are designed to attract pollinators with their color and their fragrance. And so to decorate your food with flowers, it makes it so beautiful. Whoever you're making this food for is going to feel like you're really doing your foreplay um, early today because you just made something so beautiful. And if you don't have a loved one, but you're just making meal for friends, you might find that you attract some pollinators to your boudoir. Um, <laughs> zinnias. Zinnias help to promote more laughter and good cheer. Uh, violets are actually, you know, beautiful, purple. And you can even grow them in the winter outside. I know in Colorado I had violets all winter long. I would stuff nasturtiums with guacamole for little fairy tea parties for my children. So yeah, get to know more wild edible flowers or grow some in your yard. And uh, you don't want to cook the flowers. Uh, because they turn into mush and you don't want to wash them because you want their pollen in there. Pollen is actually the sperm of the flowers. So have fun with that. There's all kinds of books on uh, flower cu culinary arts. So put them raw at the very end, but you see here flower popsicles. You can put them in ice cube trays and uh, just as a garnish on everything. I like to decorate everything I make with a different type of edible flower. Now, we were talking about the signature of plants. And I am a real advocate for eating more wild food. I lived for two and a half years in a teepee and ate nothing but wild edible plants. It's not where my parents wanted me to live, but you know, it was that got to get back to the land and everyone was buying, you know, communes and everything. And for two and a half years, we never went to the store. We found acorns and elderberries and uh, black walnuts. And it was an amazing time. But you know, if you think back a couple hundred years, people weren't going to the store then either. They were growing their food, they were trading, and they were finding things in the wild. And there's something about the wild plants. They are hardy and they are survivors. And we've been talking a lot about, at the Truth About Health Conference, about how polluted our planet is and how 
dangerous it is, are the waters and, and chemtrails and uh, chemicals that are getting into our, uh, the air we breathe and the water we drink. And I really feel that eating more wild food is one of the best ways that we can acclimate to this perilous planet. Because the wild plants survive adversity. Nobody watered them, nobody fertilized them. They even survived despite adversity. A plant that can grow through the cracks in the sidewalks is often good for helping to break up kidney stones or gallstones, herbs like marshmallow root or um, gravel root, for example. So uh, dandelion, I feel like I, I want to be a champion for the dandelion because it's said that the average American recognizes over a thousand logos and the products they're associated with. So people see, oh, Jack in the Box, oh, uh, you know, what that, mm, yeah, the Golden Arches, and the, they know what all those things mean, even children. And yet they recognize less than five plants in their area. And one of the plants they recognize, not you all, but many people say, oh, dandelions, got those in the yard, got to do something, got to get some uh, ramrod or something and do those in. And we are polluting our planet. Dandelions are not the enemy. They are one of the top five most nutritious vegetables. Dandelion leaves you can eat in the spring. And they usually flower again in the fall, and then you can eat them again. It's not that they're poisonous after they flower. It's just that they become more bitter. And Americans are not as appreciative of the bitter flavor, but the bitter flavor is good for our heart, our small intestines, and our livers. So just like we want to eat a wide variety of colors, we also want to eat a wide variety of flavors. And as a culture, we often get really stuck on sweet and salty. So a little bit of bitter is a really great thing to include in your diet. My friend Herbal Ed says, eating a little bit of bitter makes everything in your body that's supposed to squirt, squirt. Like pancreatic juices and hydrochloric acid. So the dandelion flowers are edible. And another reason that we want to honor the dandelion is that they are one of the first foods for the bees in the springtime. So we pesticide the dandelions. We are part of the problem that is causing the demise of our bee population. You can use the stems of the dandelion, just put them in hot water for a minute, and use them like noodles. And then you can dig up the root. And remember, we were saying roots energize your lower chakra is good for libido. Dandelion roots contain a starch called inulin that's not the same thing as insulin, but dandelion roots are good for stabilizing blood sugar and they also are liver detoxifying. So I like to uh, dig up the dandelion. They actually aerate the soil. So the Chinese call them puyongging, earth nail. So I dig up the dandelion, scrub them, slice them diagonally, add a little olive oil and some tamari, and then put them in the dehydrator for about four hours, just to kind of caramelize them a little bit, not to make them totally dry. But dandelion is just one, one of those plants, but the wild plants, I feel, are so superior and that's why I like to say, you know, wild thing, I think I love you. Because if you want to be a little more wild, start embracing the wildness that's right there free in your yard. And the amount of chi and vitality you feel when you eat something that was growing five minutes ago, it's unsurpassed. How long ago was that kale in the ground that you bought at Whole Foods? It could be six weeks, at least two weeks. And I'm not saying that I, I don't eat kale, I love kale. But the, the amount of vitality from something so fresh that it was just growing. One of the wild things that we do almost every day is uh, stinging nettle juice. So it doesn't sting you to drink the juice. But nettles has become one of my favorite plants. Rudolf Steiner, the founder of Anthroposophical Medicine, said, nettles are the heart of the world. And I really hope that by the time I leave this planet, that because I give 100 nettle plants away rooted every spring, that there will be hundreds of nettle patches all around Colorado. So learn what wild plants you have in your area. I used to live in Miami. I had a vegetarian restaurant in the 70s called The Supernatural. So um, even then, I remember there were all kinds of wild things we could find. So another myth is that 
Uh, people need to drink alcohol to enhance their libido. But Shakespeare said, alcohol provoketh desire, but taketh away performance. So <laughs> wise words indeed, Shakespeare. You do it every time. Um, how, and I also want to say that I think sometimes alcohol makes us make poor decisions about, you know, just how cute that certain someone is that we just met, you know? So don't allow your perceptions to be clouded with strong drink. However, there's a couple exceptions. One is Licor de Damiana, and you see it comes in these voluptuous uh, bottles. Um, and I thought I was so cool. I was in Mexico one day, and I went around, Tiene usted Licor de Damiana? And I brought a few bottles back with me, only to find that they do sell it in the U.S. Damiana, um, we'll see a picture of it in a minute, but it is a traditional liqueur in Central America, and very often the mother of the bride, uh, I'm sorry, the mother of the groom, will give a bottle of Damiana liqueur to the bride to help to lessen her inhibitions and help her to be more relaxed and welcoming to her beloved. Now, another exception is mead, because mead is made from honey. And I know we've all heard the term honeymoon. It used to be in ancient European times that when a couple got married, they were given a month's supply of mead so that they could get to know each other. And so when the mead ran out, it was said that the honeymoon is over. <laughs> so I am a medical herbalist by profession, and I love this so much. So I want to talk about some of the herbs that could be used to enhance libido. So ashwagandha is in the same family as tomatoes. It's in the nightshade or the solanaceae family. And you can see that it has these little tomato looking like fruits on it. But it is the root that is most often used. Ashwagandha has many affectionate names in Ayurvedic medicine, the medicine of, from India. They say, she who has a hundred husbands is one of the things they call it. They also say, smells like a horse, but calm like a cow. <laughs> there you go. So ashwagandha is considered an adaptogen. And adaptogen is an herbal term that means it's a plant that can help your body adapt to stressful situations. It can help you adapt to um, if you need more energy, but on the other hand, if you can't sleep, adaptogens can help you to move into a more peaceful state as well. So ashwagandha, um, I, I prefer to use herbs that grow in this country, but I'm totally open to using herbs from all around the world. But we're finding out that a lot of the herbs that are part of uh, Chinese or Ayurvedic medicine will thrive well, especially in a place like Florida. So um, think outside the box. Think about what you might be able to grow on your balcony and bring it indoors. Or, um, and of course, you, when I talk about herbs, I do want to say, because people always say, well, how do you use them? So the answer over and over is you could use them in a tea you can buy a tincture of them and tinctures are usually herbs that have been steeped in some sort of food grade alcohol like vodka or brandy but they could also be made in apple cider vinegar or vegetable glycerin or you could also take them in a capsule or tablet okay so those are the three uh, common ways of using them, but many of them can also be added to soups and uh, other teas that you're making. And rather than thinking that you need to reinvent something, if you go to a health food store and you say you're looking for some herbs to enhance libido, you're going to find formulas that maybe have four or five or six of these different plants already combined together. So it's not like you need to buy six different bottles. You're going to find products that are, have already taken the confusion out of it, like how much do I use and how do I powder it? So ashwagandha is one of our allies. Well, we could certainly say that asparagus is another food that has that doctrine of signatures phallic shape that is good for libido. I mean, just eating asparagus turns your thoughts to... Hmm, I wonder what's going to happen next. But um, in Chinese medicine, asparagus root is said to promote feelings of love and compassion. And it's very common for Chinese herbalists to put their herbs away. They put them in these cute little drawers, 
but they keep a little bit of asparagus root in their pocket and nibble on it during the day so they stay nice and calm and considerate to all the tourists that might come in the shop or how busy it gets. And asparagus root is really quite delicious. It's very sweet. It's said to um, nourish vaginal lubrication. It's a wonderful herb for women who've had hysterectomies or postmenopausal women. And it, it tastes so delicious, so it makes a great tea by itself, but you can even add it to um, soups and if you uh, want to use it raw, just soak it first and it'll get really soft. And then you can even add it to blended soups. So asparagus is in the lily family. Hmm. So is aloe vera. Okay, so here's a picture of the Damiana. So I know it sounds a little bit tedious because all these herb books, they always have the Latin name of the plant. But Latin names are the language of science. And they're the same in every language. And that's really a great thing. So I just want you to notice the Latin name of Damiana is Turnera aphrodisiaca. So obviously it's telling us that this plant has a long history of use as an aphrodisiac. Uh, people have... Um, used it to uh, not only enhance passion in their life, but to help make them less inhibited or self-conscious. It's great for people that are maybe with a new partner that don't really feel confident, they're a little shy, and um, some people have even smoked it in a water pipe. I'm not trying to encourage you to start smoking anything, but um, that's another use of it. And of course, you saw the voluptuous Damiana liqueur bottles that are available. So this is one of the most popular herbs that you will find in most of the libido-enhancing formulas, epimedium. And it's in the same family as uh, Oregon grape, which is a common antimicrobial herb. But epimedium uh, also has the folk name of horny goatweed. Horny goatweed, for a reason, because it makes goats behave even more lavishly than they normally do. So um, epimedium enhances testosterone production, helps to make women more orgasmic. And so the nice thing about using herbs to enhance libido is they nourish your body. Remember, they're taking nutrients from the earth and they're giving you trace minerals and vitamins. You're connecting with, um, you know, being rooted. They have flavors that affect your brain. So I think it's really wonderful when you taste something, your brain is responding to that right away. So horny goat weed, epimedium. Use the weed and you'll succeed. There you go. Um, it's the um, inner bark of the of the. The, of the root, the, inner, the little bark of the root. So ginkgo, ginkgo's gotten a lot of press in recent years as a wonderful herb for memory. Classically in Asian medicine, it's regarded as a kidney tonic. And remember, we started out by talking about if you want to enhance your libido, you want to think about nourishing and strengthening your kidneys. So we know that ginkgo uh, enhances peripheral circulation. So not only is that going to affect your feet, and your fingers, but also the genitals as well. And uh, ginkgo has long been regarded as a um, kidney tonic. It's a very ancient tree. It survived the Ice Age. And it's planted along a lot of busy city streets because it survives drought and air pollution and um, growing you know, out of cement, practically. I have a picture of it in the fall because the ginkgo leaves are actually at their prime when they turn yellow. That's when their uh, flavonoid content is highest. So usually, if we were collecting leaves, we would want green leaves. But in the case of ginkgo, we want them when they're yellow, higher ginkolide um, content. So ginkgo, uh, yes, it can improve memory. Well, that's a good thing. But it also is a great herb for improving hearing and vision, uh, ringing in the ears and just general longevity and circulatory improvement. It's even good for like pain on walking. A lot of times people that are elderly um, shuffle, their circulation is very poor in their feet. Consider ginkgo an ally. However, ginkgo can be blood thinning. So you wanna be aware of that. So if someone who um, is maybe uh, concerned about 
their blood being too thin, um, might not want to use ginkgo. So for every herb, it's my friend Rosemary Gladstar likes to say, for every herb you take, it's good to read about it in three different places to make sure it's okay. There's certainly herbs you don't want to use during pregnancy, and an herb that could be blood thinning, if you knew you were going to have surgery, you wouldn't want to take an herb that would be blood thinning because it could make you more likely to bleed. However, if we were really concerned about that, we should really question the wisdom because so many doctors are pushing that people over 40 should take an aspirin every day to thin your blood. And we know that that can cause internal bleeding and hemorrhaging and bleeding in the bowels and ulcers, for example. So ginseng is an herb that has a long reputation of being an aphrodisiac. And it really works because it's good for exhaustion. So ginseng is one of those roots. It's not a quick growing plant. A ginseng root can take seven years to mature. That's why it's so expensive. Emperors have been known to pay $10,000 for a single root. The plant is said to be anthropomorphic, that sometimes the plant even looks sort of like a human physique, having arms and legs and sometimes even genitals as well. Um, there's two varieties of ginseng that I've written up here. Panax ginseng is the Asian ginseng, and then Panax kinkafolium is the American ginseng. However, nowadays a lot of ginseng that is being sold as Asian ginseng started out as American ginseng that was then shipped to Asia to be cooked in wine and herbs to make it more yang, make it more warming. And so it's really the cooking it in wine and herbs that gives it the more red color. But red ginseng is said to have a hotter quality to it, and American ginseng is, is more cool. And there's a myth out there that ginseng is just for men, but I don't buy that at all. I think a lot of times women maybe need some energy boost. Um, I think that it's fine for both men and women. But you also want to look at your constitution. You might not want to use ginseng when it's really hot for example, in the heat of the summer, or if you already have high blood pressure, ginseng might be contraindicated. Also classically in Asian medicine, people under 40 are not recommended to use ginseng on a regular basis. It's one of those things you save for when you're older. Just like you tell your 12 year old, I don't want you to start drinking coffee, you're too young. The same thing with ginseng, like you don't need, if you're under 40, you need to be finding that strength and energy you know, elsewhere, but when you're over 40, you can use ginseng as a enhancer. And it is also an adaptogen. Ginseng can help improve mental clarity, worker productivity, uh, accuracy on the job, as well as libido. So another herb that is native to South America that's been getting a lot of press is maca, Lepidium peruvianum. And as you can see, maca, it's these nice round roots. It's a very close relative of turnip and rutabaga. And it does grow, it's native to Peru. Peruvianum, after all, means uh, native to Peru. And you can see that it comes in different colors and varieties. So one of the stories about maca is that when the Spanish uh, conquistadores went to Peru, they noticed that their animals were not so fertile. They weren't reproducing. They weren't having more foals and calves. And it was the Quechua Indians who said, if you bring them up high above the tree line and they can feast on this root, maca, they'll become fertile again. And, and it's really interesting about maca. Maca is such a close relative to turnip and rutabaga that I suggest using it as a food rather than taking it as a tincture or a capsule. Why not just get maca powder and put it in smoothies? I've made uh, raw vegan maca ice cream. I've made maca chocolate. It has a nice butterscotchy flavor. You can sprinkle it on top of your soaked chia seeds in the morning. So yeah, make friends with maca. It's really so great. And because a lot of the foods that do grow so well in Peru, like uh, quinoa, for example, um, they seem to also grow well in Colorado. So I wouldn't be surprised if we find that maca also translates to growing well, even in high altitude, colder climates. 
So most everyone knows about oats and the saying, you know, oh, he's just sow sowing his wild oats. Of course, women get called more derogatory terms for doing the same thing, so <laughs> we need to think about that. But not only are oats a uh, nourishing grain, of all the grains, they are in the Poaceae or the grass family, so they are relatives of wheat, rye, barley, spelt in Kamut. But um, oats are, have a higher fat content, and they are actually very warming and nourishing. And they are really enhancing for libido. Notice they have that sort of mucilaginous quality to them. Most oats that you buy have been heated, so if you want to get really raw oats, um, go for the oats that you can soak overnight and sprout. But you can also make tea from the entire oat plant. So it's not only the grain that's used, but the grassy portion of the plant and the young, unripe seeds are super nourishing for the nervous system. They're great for people who have anxiety, who feel like they're going crazy, who feel like they need help sleeping. And um, so make friends with oats. They really nourish you. You can even add them to the bath and soak in the bathtub. Um, they are so beneficial for the nervous system. Well, this one is certainly a doctrine of signatures. It's been found that pine pollen enhances testosterone production. And one of my favorite little springtime things to do is go off and um, find some pine trees that have these young, juicy little um, buds right here and just pop them in your mouth. They are so full of rich uh, juice and they're, they're very phallically shaped, but they are a wonderful uh, libido enhancer. Another thing you can do, if you let them mature, they pass the juicy stage and then they become full of pollen. And so in areas where there's lots of pine trees, you often have this yellow dust on your uh, cars where people say, oh, it's, it's pine pollen. So I like to go out in a paper, with a paper bag and just shake the pine pollen in the paper bag and then collect the pollen and then add that to smoothies or add that to things like flax crackers. And so these wild foods are really the ultimate superfoods. I know there's so many superfoods we can buy that come from other countries, but really, the ultimate superfoods are the fresh ones that you can find yourself. And what a nice adventure to go out with your beloved and go harvest some wild things yourself. So raspberry leaf is, raspberries are in the rose family. Raspberry leaf has a flavor much like black tea. So if you are stuck on black tea and you would like to uh, find an herb that is mineral rich, I would suggest raspberry leaf. It's very high in calcium, magnesium, and iron. And it also contains an alkaloid called fragorine, which is said to make labor easier. I don't know how much harder it would be without it, but I'm not going to take that chance. I drank raspberry leaf three cups every day during both of my pregnancies and had two wonderful home births. Raspberry leaf, it's good for men as well. Men need calcium, magnesium, and iron. Um, but it is an herb that can help prevent miscarriage. It's an herb that is very nourishing even when healing from sexual trauma. It's an herb that can be an ally during menopause for difficult menstrual cycles. Now. This time of year, people sometimes say, I have a lot of raspberry leaves. Would you like to come collect them? So we wanted to remember that when the plant is new in the springtime, first it puts energy into developing the leaves. That's when you want to collect the leaves. Then it makes the flower. Then it makes the fruit. And then, I know you probably don't get frost here, then the energy descends back into the roots. So you always want to think about collecting whatever plant you're using when it's at its prime for that part of the plant. So raspberry leaf tea, it, it does contain a lot of tannins in it, which is one of the reasons why it can help prevent miscarriage. Um, I have some friends who are using it to make kombucha instead of using black tea, because kombucha is basically made with sugar and black tea. And, some, you know, fruity things. Okay, maybe one last herb here. 
I say that, but there could be others. Rhodiola rosea. This is also one of those wonderful adaptogens. And I was teaching in Iceland this summer, and I saw rhodiola growing on the side of a cliff with the waves pounding at it and the winds whipping it all around. And I said, that plant has got to be good for you because it's such a survivor. It survives such difficult conditions. And we know that rhodiola grows in Siberia. They also call it Arctic root or, or rose root. It has a, the root has a nice smell, kind of like roses. The plant is edible. It's a relative of sedum. You can grow it in rock gardens. But rhodiola, much like the ashwagandha that we started out with, is an adaptogen. It can help your body adapt to different um, altitude and atmospheric changes, but also just to the stress of being in relationships. So um, consider this an ally for building your chi. It's a tonic and is also considered a great herb of longevity. Oh, no, there's, there's more herbs. Okay, this is an herb that grows in Florida, saw palmetto. And saw palmetto, it's the berries that are used. You can see the little clusters of reddish, orange, sometimes purplish berries that are growing there. And that's the part that you want to use. Now, I know it does grow in Florida. And I want to caution you that there have been a few deaths related to saw palmetto berries. People going out in the Everglades and getting eaten by alligators. Okay, so you can buy the berries already at the health food store. You don't have to go out in a canoe in the, you know, in the swamp land. Um, but it's been found that saw palmetto berries can reduce prostatic inflammation as well as the leading drugs that are offered. I'm going to try to avoid mentioning uh, specific names, but it can help prevent frequent nighttime urination, which is often a problem for men and women, as, as well as um, all the other things that go along with prostatic inflammation, um, such as dribbling and um, incomplete urination. So um, if you do harvest saw palmetto berries or buy them whole at the health food store, they will break your blender. So really, this is one of those plants that I would say buy it already tinctured or already in the capsule unless you don't value your $500 Vitamix because it will be over. Okay, so this herb, this is a noxious weed, and I know it grows in Florida because I remember stepping on it. Tribulus, tribulus terrestris. The Latin name means terrible earth. Because when you step on it barefoot, it's got these little puncture things. They also call it caltrop or goat head. Do you all know what I mean? Yes, but it's those very same little pricks that are really good for enhancing libido and building testosterone production. So I love to show up at city council meetings when they want to talk about how they need to spray herbicides. And I'll bring in bottles from the pharmacy that I work at. I work at a um, holistic pharmacy part-time. And I'll say, well, we sell that stuff for $30 a bottle. All this stuff that you think are noxious weeds, um, they're actually used in medicine. So tribulus terrestris, puncture vine, don't... Um, ride your bike over it, it could puncture the bike tire. But that also shows you this is a plant with a lot of strength and ability to penetrate <laughs> all things. So th this herb, um, I was making a little joke here, yo, him, be, yo, himbe. It's a native herb to Africa. And this is an herb to use with caution. And it is in a lot of formulas. And I, I want to mention this because using herbs takes a little bit of education. We don't want to just go into it blindly and think, you know, everything's okay. Yohimbe, also known as African uh, red bark, should not be used with high blood pressure. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of men that have erectile dysfunction are on high blood pressure medicine. And the high blood pressure medicine lowers your uh, erectile ability. So this is an herb that's not for people who are on uh, high blood pressure meds. It's also not good for people with kidney or liver disease. It has been used in the pharmaceutical industry. It's long been used by veterinarians to get animals to mate. You bring your prize stallion over to meet someone's prize mare, and you want them to do more than 
chew grass together. So yohimbe has been used. What it does is it stimula stimulates the ganglion nerve center at the base of the spine. It does cause erection. It also causes excitation in women, a, f a sensation in the genital region. Um, but it's an herb to use with education. It should not be combined with alcohol or recreational drugs. So um, caution, hot. Got it? So a little bit about uh, essential oils. So essential oils are part of the whole herbal pharmacopoeia that we can use. And there's a lot of different ways we can use them. Whenever I change the sheets, I like to put in a spray bottle uh, water and essential oils, and then I spray the bed. And so when you get into your bed that night, it's like a, a perfumed palace or something. Um, you can also bathe with a few drops of essential oils, maybe seven to 10 drops in the bath. It's always best if you fill the tub up first. Uh, because essential oils evaporate very quickly. They're also known as volatile oils. You can uh, use them as perfume. You know, most perfumes are made from petrochemicals. They're not made from flowers anymore. It's not a kind industry. Um, they can be highly allergenic for most people. Uh, what else can you do with essential oils? When I wash the hair brushes, I put essential oils on the hair brushes. So you're like in a cloud of essential oils. You can also get wonderful diffusers. So one of my favorite uh, gifts, I gave these for the holidays last, last uh, season, was these little aromatherapy misters. They change colors, they put humidity in the air, and they will also diffuse essential oils. So the essential oils that are best for enhancing thoughts of pleasure and passion, well, rose is a really good one. But rose is also about $150 an ounce. So that right there could detract from your libido. Think, just think about, oh, the credit card bill that's going to come. But, but rose, granted, is one of those. But you could also use a plant like rose geranium. Remember that when we talk about essential oils, we want pure essential oils because anything could be labeled as aromatherapy. Sometimes I'm in someone's bathroom and I'll say like, oh, they have lilac bubble bath and I'll look at the label and it's got purple dye in it and it's never seen a lilac ever. So just know that anything can be called aromatherapy and it might not be the real deal. So we want pure essential oils. But jasmine is another one. Jasmine is good for lowering inhibitions, uh, helping you to feel more open-hearted. It's a beautiful fragrance. Um, neroli, we get three essential oils from the orange plant, which you have an abundance of here in Florida. We get orange essential oil, which is from the peel. We get petty grain, which is from the twigs. And then we have neroli, which is from the delightful orange flowers. So a little trick and a way to save you some money is if you go to a Middle Eastern market, buy yourself some rose water or some orange flower water or some jasmine flower water and add a little bit of that in your smoothies or if I'm making a frosting for a cake, maybe it's made with like macadamia nuts and um, soaked dates. And instead of any, adding any liquid, I'll use a little bit of rose water. And then everyone says, how did you do this? Oh, this is so wonderful. So again, you know, really for sensuality and libido, we want to turn on all our senses. That's why we're talking about taste and smell and, you know, sensuous fabrics and you know creating a, a, a room that is like full of beauty and and uh, cushiness so another one cardamom cardamom is the third most expensive spice in the world it's a relative of ginger cardamom ha is very sensual it's in chai it's uh, the, fortunately the essential oil is not nearly as pricey as the cardamom seeds Sandalwood is another one of those herbs much preferred by uh, men. However, sandalwood is endangered in the wild. 
It takes 30 years for a sandalwood tree to grow to maturity. So if I were creating an aromatherapy product, I would not use sandalwood just because I think it's rarely sustainable. I, I know that there are some companies that are growing it deliberately, and, and that's fine, but I think a lot of it, for example, the island of Molokai in Hawaii has been deforested. It was all full of sandalwood, and it was all deforested to make sandalwood incense and sandalwood beads. And so we vote with our dollars. Every time we make a decision to buy something, it's saying, this is the kind of world I want to create. This is how I'm doing my part. So everything is a conscious decision. It has been found that there's two smells in particular that appeal to men's sexuality. And this was a, a legitimate study done on college men, complete with electrodes to measure their level of sexual excitement. The two smells that were the most libido enhancing were pumpkin pie spice and cinnamon buns. Both contain cinnamon, so you don't need the buns or the pie. You can just use cinnamon. However, cinnamon applied directly to your skin will burn. Okay, so you can use it in a diffuser. You could add a few drops in massage. You can also use cinnamon in your cuisine. Um, so cinnamon is just, when you're making food, think about adding cinnamon to just about everything that you make. I like to think I helped save my parents' marriage years ago by putting cinnamon in everything. We're having cinnamon rice pudding and cinnamon, <laughs> cinnamon, uh, <laughs> cinnamon cake, yes, cinnamon cake to that too. Cinnamon French toast. Um, so cinnamon, uh, it stabilizes your blood sugar. It's a wonderful herb, one of the premier herbs for helping diabetes right now. And the smell of cinnamon causes you to linger longer, linger longer. So if you had a place of business and you want people to come in and like shop around, look around, try on things, if you have a diffuser with some cinnamon in there, that's good. I have a friend who, she sells houses, and she goes into the house before she's about to show it, and she goes in, she puts on a coal light bulb, cinnamon, in the kitchen, and, and then the, the, you know, the wife says, honey, I can just see myself making an apple pie in here. You know, and then you go in the bathroom, and it smells like jasmine. Honey, I, can, I think that this, I can just picture myself taking a bath here. So essential oil, when we smell something, the molecules go into our nasal cavities and go into our, affect our brain and our bloodstream. So anything that you smell, it's going into you. So you really want to be thinking about, you know, all the things that have aromas, um, and it, that includes your lotions and your sunscreens if you use them and, you know, the, the perfume. So everything is really an opportunity for better health. So I also wanted to say something about the wor word uh, tantra. The word tantra uh, literally means weaving your lives together. And I know people often think, well, tantra, isn't that that practice where you make love and the man doesn't ejaculate? That can be part of it as well. But Tantra can also be having a partnership with someone. It could be making a commitment to let's, let's grow a garden together. Let's eat healthier together. Let's make a commitment that we're both going to, you know, lose 10 pounds or that we're going to give up, you know, eating sugar or give up, you know, some of our addictions. So I see all of that as Tantra. It could be decorating the house. So all of those things are ways of weaving your lives together. But I also want to say that Ejaculate is not a waste product. It's full of seeds and nourishment. And one of the ways that men can contribute to their demise in debilitating their kidneys is by ejaculating too much. Masturbation, too much, you know, pornography. Just like, you know, treating it like a waste product isn't really valuing these seeds of creation. So I really like to have a sense of all our chakras in working order and everything being an opportunity for choosing the high road, the highest good. So uh, again, I'm not saying don't ever ejaculate, but, but if we don't honor this part of our body, it could really be depleting. I remember I had a 16-year-old boy come to see me because he was losing his hair. And I said, look, I don't need to know, but you need to back off the masturbation because it's depleting you. And uh, you know, you shouldn't be losing your hair when you're 16, that's way too young. Um, 
I said I would say a few things about vitamins. So I know erectile dysfunction is a concern for uh, men. One of the things we should keep in mind that the frequent use of statin drugs, of giving people cholesterol-lowering drugs, we need some cholesterol in order to make hormones. So when we go on medication that impairs our cholesterol production, Cholesterol doesn't have to be the big enemy that it's been reported to be. We can also affect our libido. So then, you know, one drug leads to another. So you take, you know, cholesterol-lowering drugs, and then you, need, uh, then you need Viagra, and then you need something else. So if we think about nourishing ourselves and that our sexuality is part of our entire being and that we're going to be patient and loving with ourselves and we're going to build our sexual energy and we're going to you know work with our partner and and be patient and find ways to enhance our relationship that's really nourishing and that's going to be long lasting um, I do want to say that there is an amino acid called arginine that can be very, very effective in enhancing erectile function. Um, you know, something that you can buy at health food stores. Nuts are also very high in arginine, so again, a reminder to include more of those wonderful nuts, walnuts, for example, in your diet. Um, so, Having a relationship is an opportunity of, like having an opportunity to work through your issues, your past, the, the drama that maybe you need to heal from, from your, your childhood or your first marriage. Or, um, but what a, what a pleasure. And to constantly remind your partner that you're honored to have a partner on the path, someone to go through the ups and downs of life and to walk this together, um, you know, if you want to do something wonderful for your, ch for your children, love your partner more. Children thrive so beautifully in an environment where there's love. And I don't think uh, so many children have great role models right now. Certainly it's not being conveyed in you know, the home life and in the media. So I'd love to take a few minutes for questions about anything. Yes. For circulation of the lymph, my favorite herb is cleavers, gallium aparine, cleavers. And it's a springtime growing plant. But other things that are good for the lymphs, rebounding or jumping on a little trampoline and walking and like really letting your arms swing and putting some stretch in your groin area, drinking lemon and water. And I like to not only do cleavers as a tea, but I juice cleavers as well. Thank you. Yes. You, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, nettle juice. What do you think of nettle tea? Nettles, nettles, nettles. I love nettles. Um, when I make nettle tea, I do an overnight infusion. So I take a ball jar and I put maybe a couple inches of dried nettles in it, cover it to the top with hot water and let it sit overnight. Since I got into raw foods around 2000, I'm, I'm not 100% raw, but I, I do herbs a lot differently now. I don't like boil things so much. So I'm always trying to preserve the enzymes. I think that's really important. And we'll talk more about that tonight in our panel. But um, a quart of nettle tea a day is great for your bones, your teeth, your hair, your libido, your well-being. It's anti-allergenic. And uh, nettles are great for people that are allergic to everything. And I'm even big on getting stung with nettles. Getting stung with nettles, it's an ancient tradition called nettles urtication. And people that have arthritic joints should get stung with nettles. Hair loss, sting your scalp with nettles. I don't think I'm ever going to get a facelift. It just doesn't go with my lifestyle. I sting my face with nettles in the morning. Yeah, yeah. That's a Jedi trick, I'll tell you. And you know, it was once used before Viagra because it increases peripheral blood flow and it does stimulate erection. I kid you not. And I would never share any, I would never tell you that if I hadn't done all these things myself at some point. Yes. Hi, Brigitte. Um, so what's a way that you would know how much of something you should use or to cycle it if you're not going to an herbalist or you're not getting blood work? 
do you cycle things? Yes, I, I like to call it pulsing. So let's say I find out that there's an herb like, that would be really good for me. Cleavers would be really good for me. I might do it 10 days on, three days off, 10 days on, three days off. But I also think that emotional attitude comes first and then food. So I don't want to use herbs allopathically. Because I think there's this whole movement, like people going to the health food store and say, what do you have for high blood pressure? You know, and it's like, well, have you thought about meditation? Have you thought about backing off a of coffee? Have you thought about, you know, this or that? So um, herbs are like the third thing that I use. And it's always, like I said, read about it in three different places. And there are some herbs that are appropriate for daily use. And they're often the herbs that grow prolifically, like dandelion and red clover and cleavers. And then the herbs that are like rare and far away and expensive and, you know, over $50 a pound. Maybe those herbs are saying, use me when you really need me. Echinacea, you don't need to use it every day. Echinacea is a wonderful herb for our immune system. But we wouldn't take antibiotics all the time, nor would we want to take an herb that had um, an immune-stimulating, white blood cell-stimulating activity. Use that when you need it. And then maybe use it a lot for a short period of time. So I tr did my best to explain um, sort of the contraindications in my phone app, the iPlant, which is two ninety nine at the iPlant at the i app store. If you have an iPhone, we're working on an Android version. Thank you, Wendy, for your question. Hi, uh, I've really enjoyed this. This is fantastic. And uh, you were talking about survivor herbs, and it, it, chaparral came to my mind. I don't know if it's you know a lot of times the old Dr. Christophers and and some of the old herbalists used to use chaparral. Are, have you? Any familiarity with that? Sure. Chaparral grows a lot more in the southwestern desert area, like Arizona and um, southern New Mexico. And it's an interesting plant because nothing grows right around it. A lot of the herbs that are traditional anti-cancer herbs seem to repel other things from growing right around it. Like black walnut, when it falls on the ground, like nothing grows around there. So chaparral has been used as an anti-cancer herb, it contains something, norahydragora acetic acid, some big NDGA, we call it. Um, now, a few years ago, the FDA had some alarm, like, oh, chaparral causes liver damage. And I actually, being a member at the time of the American Herbal Products Association, went to a meeting with the FDA and some of other herbalists, and they showed on the overhead projector the dreaded chaparral. And it wasn't even chaparral. They had the wrong plant. So I do use chaparral, and I have used it uh, topically and internally. It's very terrible tasting. Um, it's also a wonderful herb against the herpes virus. So, it, so people that suffer from herpes might think about doing a teaspoon of chaparral tincture first thing in the morning for 21 days in a row. And I'm not saying it's a cure, but it will make the virus lose its virulence and kind of like not show its veracity for a long time. Okay, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Um, yes, well, oh, I think the mic is going over there, so. Is there something you can do for hot flashes? Yes, for hot flashes. So uh, I'll, I'll say a few things about menopause. So we were talking about how the kidneys have a lot to do with libido. But it's our liver, liver and gallbladder, that's the organ system that's associated with reproductive health, such as fertility, menstrual health, cramps, hot flashes. And so we dishonor our livers when we eat fried foods and saturated fats, when we use oils that are you know, processed with high temperature. Um, our livers love the sour flavor, so eating more berries and more lemon and water. But one of my favorite remedies for hot flashes is to get, fill a little water sprayer bottle um, with like maybe eight ounces of water and then add 30 drops of peppermint essential oil. And whenever you're having a hot flash, just close your eyes, take off your glasses, close your mouth and miss, 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 miss your chest, your wrist. Oh, 
instant bliss. But um, really, rather than thinking about we need to tweak our hormones or we need hormone replacement, we really should be thinking about how can we be kinder to our liver. And I know that you know one of the drugs that has long been recommended during menopause was made from pregnant mayor's urine. And, um, you know, and they had all these things that it was going to be so good and help prevent us. I mean, we can protect our bones with nettle tea and horsetail tea. We can eat green leafy vegetables like kale. We can eat the, use the inner stem of the kale, you know, that really tough part. Go ahead and juice that or put that in your green smoothies because that's great for your bones. It looks kind of like the bones. It's like the bones of the kale. Um, and then... You know, stay really, every, menopause, I think we have to have an attitude of like, oh, that's interesting. You know, like, oh, three periods a month, that's interesting. You know, don't get too uptight about a hot fly, oh, that's interesting. You know, consider like a, a rush. It's a surge, a power surge. And another thing about menopause is it's a good time in life to say, what is it that I want to do in my life that I've never done yet, that I put off because I was raising children, raising a family, helping my boss, my husband, on and on. It's like, you know, start making your bucket list of what you want to do. I just went to Burning Man. I'll tell you, I completed that one, but that was on the bucket list, and I'm done now. I think once was enough, to be honest. But, um, but in any case... Um, it's really a good time to think about like organizing your life. Do you have a will? You know, I, I have the attitude, having gone through menopause, I don't really need to buy any more books on feng shui. I need to just do it. <laughs> just, you know, read the ones I have. I don't need any more herb books. I, you know, I have a lifetime supply. But um, there are herbs for menopause. Some of the most popular, motherwort is another really good one for hot flashes. You could use that as a tincture or a tea or capsules. It's in the mint family. Motherwort. Uh, I think there was a question there first. Yes. So um, I want to say thank you for bringing all this information to us. It's so thank wonderful you. to have you here and uh, an honor to be in your presence. Uh, also, I suffer myself from psoriasis and I have friends that uh, suffer from skin conditions, many. It runs in my family and people I work with uh, suffer from the same. And I personally have changed the water I was drinking. Uh, we got a, a reverse osmosis filter, and since then, with application of a solve by Pure Remedy, I've seen major um, improvement in my skin. Not completely healed, but way better. Um, I'm wondering, for those who don't have the water filters at home, is there an herb or a flower that we can infuse our water with to make it cleaner and uh, help our bodies to hydrate more because our water just seems to be so poisoned nowadays. Well, clean air and clean water really are a, a basic thing we want to start with. So, you know, you getting purified water, water delivered, but also putting your intention into water. I know in my water dispenser, I have crystals in there. I have little intentions stuck on the water thing, you know, like, you know, all kinds of positive affirmation, blessing your water, gratitude. Um, my, one of my housemates just wrote a book, a wonderful book called Psoriasis Free and Clear. It's a wonderful book. She talks about her journey. She talks about, you know, going gluten-free and dairy-free. She talks about using enzymes, supplementation, about using turmeric, um, because turmeric's a great anti-inflammatory herb. She talks about looking at the emotional components of like, you know, wanting to claw out of your skin. It's always good to look at what meridian or over what organ system one might be affected. But skin ailments, you know, it's always good to look at food sensitivities too. Um, and there's other herbs, burdock root, dandelion root, yellow dock root, uh, a cup or a quart of tea infused overnight could be really life-changing as well. So in a way, by adding herbs to your water, in the sense of making a tea, could also be a powerful remedy. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. not used one of these before. Um, hi, I just wanted to ask, um, I got some, like a, like a coffee thing and, and clearing my throat thing uh, a lot. And uh, I've read a lot about oregano oil 
and I wanted to hear what you had to say about that. Okay. Um, and I know our time is almost up. Oregano oil is a very powerful antimicrobial oil. I wouldn't suggest using it every day because it's so strong, but it is something that I do use for long lingering coughs. But again, we don't want to band-aid it. If, like if someone had a chronic cough, I would say, maybe there's something you're eating that your body is producing phlegm to protect itself against kind of like a grain of sand in the oyster it makes a pearl and you know the first things i think of are dairy and gluten okay and you don't do those but you know soy is a common allergen corn's a common allergen could be particles that you're breathing sometimes people like you know they're allergic to cats but they have three that they sleep with you know so it's always good, you know, being a herbalist is like being a detective. It's like, and I always ask, what was going on in my life when this started? And to see if there's anything about that. And then another aspect is like, <clears throat> I really want to be heard. I don't feel like I'm being heard. I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but <clears throat> nobody's... <li> <laughs> so that's good to look at too. Like, what do you need to get off your chest? And sometimes, you know, they're not going to hear it, so you have to write it. You got to write a book or something. So I know our, our time is up and I want to give fair time to the other person, but if I have time for one more question, I will take it. <laughs> Hello, I have a question. <laughs> um, I, I sometimes uh, help people with de detoxification uh, treatments and you know, the body odor uh, gets really strong. So I want to ask you in your experience, what herbs do you recommend or oils or essentials? Uh, to help in these periods, the periods when you are like detoxifying, that the odors are really strong. Well, internally chlorophyll, which is in green leafy plants, and there's chlorophylls that come in liquid. Um, you know, alfalfa tea would be something that's really high in chlorophyll. Nettle tea is really high in chlorophyll. But I also think that a lot of times a bad body odor might be due to eating a food that your body doesn't really like. Like you might think it likes cheese, but you smell cheesy. Or, or, or you know, we usually don't go for perfumes that smell like meat or cheese. You know, so I would wonder if there's something that they're eating. But chlorophyll is an internal deodorizer, and there's no harm in doing lots of it. Chlorophyll is like, the, like blood, plant blood. And it's very close to our blood. There's, a wonder, there's some wonderful products, Chlorofresh, Chloroxygen, that I use, and that can be very helpful. Okay, and then, you know, pepper, a little drop of peppermint oil in your water might help too. So I think that's all our time. Thank you so much, Stephen. <laughs> the truth about health, blessed be.